And so as you may know, we're spending time this month, it's February month, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trusting that Valentine's Day is, is just a reminder on February the 14th, but we're all uh, petitioning our Valentines all the time and living loving lives and relationship-focused lives uh, because we are uh, relational beings. Relationships to us are very, very important. They cost us a lot. Uh, we invest a lot in those things. And so becoming skillful, as it were, to understanding relationships and how they work, how to nurture them, how to have life-giving, whole relationships in the people that are around us is, is an essential part of what it means to be a human and certainly what it means to live a life of meaning and purpose and a life that you enjoy that's constantly being invigorated with life and strength. I tell you, one of the main ways that you do that is by having healthy, strong relationships around you. And so we've spent the month so far, uh, we started with honor and dealing with the issues of honor, and then we did expectancy, and then we did, uh, help me Lord, loyalty. And today we're going to be talking about the P in that y'all need help, uh, whatever byline that we had coming into this uh, month. And the P t uh, stands for perception. And that may not seem like it's a huge relational thing, I would have maybe gone with gifts or dinner out or, you know, maybe a new pair of shoes or something like that that would have really worked for relationships. But when you are dealing with relationships, the, one of the foundational principles that we must grasp as humans is our propensity to perceive things, to have perceptions about the situations that are going on in our lives, the people that are surrounding us in our lives, the expectancy and the dreams that we have as individuals, we all have a perception of what those things are. And you'll probably find that if you talk to any marriage counselor, any couple counselor that's out there, when they first meet you, they are very interested in finding out what is your perception of what's going on right now. And they'll take maybe 10 or 15, or if you're with me, 45 minutes to just sit there and listen because it's super interesting to me to find out what is your perception of the situation. Then I'll, if that's, your, you know, you get your 15 or 20 or 30 or 45 minutes, and then I'll ask your significant other or your partner, your couple person there to share for the equal amount of time. And it's pretty amazing, uh, you know, when we actually hear how many of the problems that we have in relationships are based on an inability or a misalignment of the perceptions that each one of us have. And so we're going to spend some time talking about that today. Perception is defined as a state of being or process of becoming aware of something through the senses. It's the awareness we have of the people, things, and situations. It's a mental impression, a way of regarding or understanding or interpreting something. And now what I want you to do is I, I'm going to give you the definition from a, for a word uh, that we, we're all familiar with. It's reality. And I want you to notice the stark difference between the definition of perception and the definition of reality. Now, I want to warn you as we step into this, you may think those two things are synonymous, that your perception of reality and a reality itself are absolutely the same thing. But listen to what the definition of reality is. It's the world or state of things as they actually exist. It is the existence that is absolute, it is self-sufficient, it's objective, and it's not subject to human decisions or conventions. How many of you know that sounds a lot different than a way of understanding or interpreting something? And so what happens to us a lot of times when we're dealing with this concept of perception, because your perception could in fact be your reality, as we'll discover in a moment, but that doesn't make it a universal reality. Your understanding of the nature of a particular situation or a particular person or a particular expectancy or a particular dream or desire it can be radically different from the person that's sitting next to you right now or the person that shares coffee with you in the morning. You can end up with a lot of problems if we don't really critically take a look at this foundational principle and really understand the boundaries that we must place in our own, uh, in governing ourselves. Yes, your perception can become your reality, even if it is not reality itself. 
Uh, Dwyer says this, loving people see a loving world. Hostile people see a hostile world. Same world. When it comes to keeping our relationships good and growing, we must learn how to manage the different perceptions that are always emerging between people. We've all, we've all heard that. Have you got the cartoon? Did that hit the wall yet? Hello? There's my, uh, anyways, there's a cart, little bit of an idea to help us to understand how simple the situation can actually be. But if we don't appreciate the nature of the difference that comes because two different people are looking at the same situation, but they're looking at it through radically often, radically different eyes. And when we can learn to appreciate that, wow, it just opens up a whole new potential in the relationships that we have. We've heard of this, you know, the, are you a glass half empty person or a glass half full person? Or to quote one of my favorite people in the world, George Collin, he says, I just see a glass that's twice as big as it needs to be. No matter what you're dealing with, as you perceive your situation, recognizing that there could be a legitimate person across the coffee table from you that sees the situation radically different, but, but has a right to that perception and didn't come to that perception lightly, we, need to, we can open up a whole new way of understanding how relationships work. And we're going to deal with something that is kind of a really tough subject. I, I kind of entered into this, you know, maybe to, 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 to title the series or the, 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 the chat that we're having today. Because when you boil this all down, you are dealing with the fundamental difference between, oh, these are nasty words, pride and humility. And we're going to unpack some of that today because I, I wouldn't be surprised to find out that most of us, myself included, can be a little bit confused about what those words, what those words actually mean and how do we uh, process them and how do we experience those things as human beings. I'm telling you, if we can grab a hold of what's actually going on inside of our being when we are, you know, uh, thin cutting all of the little things that are going on in our lives, in our relationships, I'm telling you, understanding the difference between pride and humility is an essential tool. It's an essential tool. I considered actually titling this, the, the title of today's message, How to Fix Your, Wife's, uh, your Spouse's Pride Problem. <laughs> That won't make up anywhere near what I'm about to face, though. <laughs> the reason that I was going to call this uh, series How to Fix Your Spouse's Pride Problem is so that people would actually watch it. It's actually going to be dealing... How many of you know the How to Fix Your Spouse's Pride Problem? How many of you know it's a very simple answer? Does anybody know? <laughs> Fix your own pride problem. You got it. Pride is a progressively narrowing perception. You know, when you are a young person, you probably are open-minded and you're, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, you know, you're, you're willing to listen to other people, you're, you're really, you know that you don't know anything, and so when you know that you don't know anything, you kind of keep an open mind towards things, but you know, there's this radically awesome thing when you turn 21 and grow a brain, is that you finally start having opinions. You've, you've spent, you know, if you look at the way that we develop as individuals, I have the wonderful advantage right now of watching, you know, totally newborn child, grandchildren come up and all of those wonderful experiences as they relate to the world around them. And I'm watching as they really define for me what happens to people in their formation of their mind and how they think and perceive things. Between the ages of minus nine months and, say, 10 years old, we are in this enormous data collection mode. We really don't judge a lot of things. We're not making a lot of decisions. We're just going with the flow. But what we're doing as we're going with the flow is we are absorbing literally trillions of bits and pieces of data from the world around us. And then once we get to be about 10 years old or so, I mean, it's not hard and fast on your 10th birthday or anything like that, but when you're kind of in this little bit of a zone, uh, turning, sort of heading towards your teenage years, you start to go into this process of deliberation. You kind of shut down all the data collection because it starts to get wacky. 
it, the world starts to get super big and you start to open up all of these new places of data collection and all that kind of stuff. So you kind of say, you know what, that's, we're good. And what you do is you start deliberating. You start thinking about all the little things. It's not thinking like you're sitting there, you know, in the great con cosmos considering mathematical calculations, but in the inner part of your being, what's going on in a 10 year old is they're starting to think about the things, or, or, or think about this trillion, you know, quadrillion bits and pieces of information. As they're deliberating through this season, they start to test some stuff. You probably may have noticed that, if any parents of 10 year olds, you may notice that they start to test some of their hypotheses. They start to see, I, you know, I kind of feel this and that and the other. You know, you told them that you were all that and you could do anything you want. They turn 10 years old and they realize, no, you can't do that. And so they start to have challenges. They start to try to figure all this stuff out. And that really takes the, the, the summation really of their teenage years until they kind of click over to the 2021 frame where they have tested stuff that some stuff worked and then some stuff didn't work and some stuff tragically didn't work and traumatically didn't work. And we got all of this going on inside of us. And then we click over into our 20 years. And then if you're anything over 20 right now, you are susceptible to this pride situation coming up inside of your soul. Do you know you know stuff? And you don't know stuff because you read it in a book somewhere. You know stuff because you've been to the school of hard knocks. You've kind of gathered, intensely gathered all of this information. And you took a decade to disseminate it all and kind of fit it into categories and make some decisions about things and figure some stuff out. And so you should be rewarded with that. And when you have an opinion or a perspective about something, golly, somebody should listen to you. <laughs> you can probably see where this starts to become problematic. Uh, you're 20, by the way. Now, if you're pushing 60, like some of the hair colors that I see in the room around me, <clears throat> you've had a long time in this, potentially in this narrowing way of thinking that is very resistant to the perspectives of other people. And what happens to us is that we can become very small-minded, in fact. That the only worldview, the only understanding, the only way of thinking that I am at all familiar with is my own. If you're perhaps one of those people, if you are a, a conservative, as I am, and you don't understand why liberal people have an actually well-thought-out liberal position, if you're a conservative and don't like liberals, if you're a Republican, you don't like Democrats, if you're a black man, don't like white folk, if you're a rich person that don't understand poor people, if you, and on and on and on and on and on it goes. The answer to that, I don't think it's going to be a hard piece of math for us to all accept, is that the answer for this is as young as we possibly can, and maybe that's today, we need to begin to take a look at this concept of humility and begin to understand how does it affect the way we think about the situations, about the perceptions that we have, about the perceptions that other people have. And we're gonna unpack a little bit of that today. In Colossians, it says this, therefore, as the elect of God, which are you know, the people certainly sitting in this room and maybe around the world on those cameras, holy and beloved, uh, put on, tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint, against, a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you forgive. In that beautiful piece of scripture there, it kind of crosses this term humility. And this humility is a, a I love old words, uh, the old word, the Greek word here, uh, which I'd like us all to kind of pronounce if you kind of join with me on it, is tapainafrasune. You're going gonna to work with me on this because it's such a cool word. Tapaina, say that, tapaina, frasune. Tapaina, frasune. Tapaina. Frasune. That word is made up of two different words, tapaina and frasune. That's 
probably self-evident in the way we syllabalized it. And the word tapaina is a word that says it didn't get very high off the ground. And so if you have a little plant or something like that, or maybe a puppy that's at your house and that puppy is only ever going to get six inches off the ground, then you would refer to that puppy as tapaina. It just isn't ever going to get very high off the ground. And the word frasune is really from a word that, fren is the actual word, and it talks about your mind. Uh, and so it kind of is a very interesting way of looking at this tapai na frasune word, and it means that your mind doesn't get very high off the ground. <laughs> and that would seem oftentimes, and I think this can often be a problem for us when we are sort of like the modern version of, of Christi Christians living in a, you know, in a very different world perhaps than the original Christian people, then we can often be confused about this tapai na frasune kind of concept here where it's like, well, I'm really looking for my mind to be as high off the ground as I can possibly get it. And that's, I'm, that's not talking about the pursuits of your life, whether you're learning to do something or learning, a, you know, taking a class or, you know, figuring something out or learning to play an instrument or speaking another language or doing all these other things that we can just keep on accelerating the capacity of our minds. But can I tell you something? That doesn't mean that your mind has to come very high off the ground. You can remain on your knees as you learn to play the guitar, as it were. You can remain in a place where we understand how to maintain a position of humility in our minds. And it's going to become, as you, hopefully you will see as we get down this road a little bit today, you're going to see how critical this is when it comes to developing healthy, strong, life-giving, growing, intense relationships in our lives. I have this little bit of a quote in here. It says, in our past does not predict our future, unless, of course, we refuse to learn from our mistakes. And so I think that what Jesus, when he was talking there through his half-brother uh, James or uh, his right-hand man, Peter, he says you have to deal with this humility thing. God resists the proud. He resists the mind that feels like it's way off the ground. And instead, he says, I give grace to the humble. He says, if you want to lift yourself up, then you need to get your, your, your pride way up there. If you want God to lift you up, then you need to make sure that your mind doesn't get very far off the ground. And you see, these are scriptural concepts, and I think you're going to find, even though it says here, God will lift you up, and of course he does, and God will give you grace. Yes, I believe he does. But we can often uh, find how that works in a very pragmatic way in, and practical way in the relationships that we have. And so what I'd like to talk a few points today is the humblification of our perception. I will invent new, another word today. Maybe they could title this message, humblification of, of your mind. And how do we do that? Like what is actually going on? when we go through this process of making sure that our minds haven't grown too high off the ground. Let's talk about it from this perspective. Your perceptions are a reflection of who you believe you are and are the product of what you have chosen to believe. Now, if you believe, if you, believe you are somebody who you are not or that you've chosen to believe things that are actually not true, then you can see the math here then my perception all of a sudden becomes suspect. I'm just not sure whether I, I really know who I actually am. I'm, I'm not really sure whether 100% of the things that I believe that are causing me to, to that are, that are that, you know, manufacturing my perceptions, I, I'm just not sure that 100% of those things are actually perfectly accurate. You see, when we can realize that that's where our perception comes from, well, it automatically puts me in a position that says, well, perhaps I don't know all the answers. Oh, that's hard to say, I know, but maybe my perception isn't actually reality. Maybe I'm better off if I can appreciate another person's perception. Maybe they can see something. Maybe they're perceiving something that I'm not perceiving. Maybe they're seeing something 
that I'm not perceiving. When we understand that our perception may not be an accurate assessment of reality. I think that's why in Romans chapter two, uh, Paul begins to talk to us a little bit about what we should do with our perceptions. And he says it like this, that we judge other people the way we are. He doesn't judge, we don't judge people with the way they are. We don't know how they are. Uh, we do know how we are. And when we judge a, another person or another situation, maybe a choice or an action or something of that nature, we judge it based on all of our inner data stacking. And that may not be at all what's going on. And, and, the, and the humility really comes when we just take a moment and say, well, jeepers, I may be wrong. Let's practice that. <laughs> say jeepers. jeepers, I may be wrong. Can I tell you something? If you started every one of your sentences, when you're, you know, let's say that you, you know, you can tell when the atmosphere is, is going from peaceful to argument. You know when that moment, y'all know when that moment is? Guys, you know when that moment is. Come on, work with me here. <laughs> if you just diffuse that moment there by saying, geez, I could be wrong here. That's a good place to start. Because what happens is, is that you're, Maybe telling the other person that you have a dense of humility, you listen to what's his name on Sunday. But most of all, you're kind of hitting the reset button on the pride thing that's about to come forth out of your mouth, right. driven by what's in your tapasune. <laughs> that you just need to check that for a moment. Right. Wow. Say, Jeepers, <laughs> I may not be right about this. Our perceptions are formed in tireless data collection. We own those things and they mean a lot to us. We are not gonna be people who easily give up the positions that we hold on certain things. I'm not saying that if you are a conservative or you're a Democrat or you're black or you're white or rich or you're poor, whether you're, where you, you, know, you love whales or trees, doesn't matter to me. Those are all good things. You form those things in a real way. We're not talking about becoming uh, a, a, you know, clones of one another. We're talking about empowering ourselves to receive of the perceptions of other people who may have an opinion about whales and it may be different from yours. But that doesn't mean it's not worth listening to. Because can I tell you something? It took them a long time, just like it took you a long time to actually come to a decision about how they think about whales. And we should respect that in one another. Isn't that good? Yeah. To ridicule or belittle, or minimize or marginalize someone because of these battles that they faced, <clears throat> figuring out <clears throat> what do they believe and why. What's their opinion about this particular subject and why? They should be respected for coming all the way through to the place where they have an opinion. Because all of our opinions are very hard won. All of our opinions have taken us a lot of time and deliberation to come to. Recognize my own distortions. How many of you find that to be an easy blood sport first thing in the morning? Can I tell you something? It's not easy to recognize the places where I myself could, become, could have become distorted. Until you get into the framework of realizing how much the traumas and the difficulties and the experiences and the hardships that we experience through our formative kind of don't even remember them years. Can I tell you something? We can start to appreciate, man, I could potentially have a real distorted view of per my perceptions of reality. Anybody in here not describe their childhood as dysfunctional? Is there, I've never met anybody. When I say to them, you know, my childhood was dysfunctional, they look at me and they go, I have no idea what you're talking about. Mine was perfect. That has happened what? Never? Everybody has got, grown up in dysfunctional environment. If you've grown up in a dysfunctional environment, you have some pity on yourself. Realize that you're gonna have some distorted ways of thinking. 
Imagine if we spent time with Jesus. You know, I've always, I find Jesus so far. I love reading him, reading after stuff that he says. You know, his perception of the situation was like never the same as regular folk. Never. Right. Not ever. He would shock people all the time with his perception of the situation. Now, he was right. And it was like crazy how much it was uh, different than everybody he was around. I was kind of like, I kind of feel like he was a contrarian. He just kind of made it up as he went along, just be like, but he wasn't. He actually had a perspective, as you will realize, that was super powerful. And that when we can grab onto maybe these spiritual concepts and make them practical and real in our lives, I mean, it's gonna change our lives going to change our life. Changing your perception. Let me, let me just give you a quote here. You know, the cleaner the windows, the more infinite the perspective. If you wear glasses, clean your glasses, you'll see farther. <laughs> What's that talking about? That's talking about be, deal with the stuff, deal with the trauma, deal with these, some of these things that we would describe as dysfunction. Don't, you know, don't wait till they cause a nervous breakdown. Jump on them puppies when they're babies and young and you can get a hold of them without too much difficulty. That's com completely countercultural for us because we think that having trauma is weak and it's having a distorted perception. Man, you need a psychiatrist or something. Well, you might, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about just begin to own some of that stuff and just realize that it's going to create a whole ton of biases. And those biases, if they're very extreme, which they often are and getting more so, every presidential election cycle, they seem to get more so, okay? And so we are in a really bad season of not understanding that we're not the right perspective and the right answer and the right way at looking at something and the right path forward. We're losing our ability to do that. We've got this amazing situation where you can go and join a forum of people all around the world that are just like you and spend the rest of your life convincing yourself that you must have the right perspective because you and all your friends have the same one. You know, can I tell you, that's a bad road. That's a bad road. Changing your perception requires much deeper work than just winning or losing an argument or a battle on perspectives. Perspectives Perceptions are formed in the crucible of many different and often traumatic experiences. If we have this idea that I'm going to argue you into a new perception, can I tell you something? That is radically untrue. Radically untrue. Now, I may want to argue with you in order to beat you down and get my way. Let's say I've done that once or twice. But that's not going to help the situation. If we can get away from the idea that somehow my well-crafted and sculpted words of beauty and dignity today are going to radically transform the very future, and no, that's not gonna work like that. You may grab hold of this idea and realize that, man, I got some work to do and I need to start paying attention to it. And as you do, and as you go, and as you realize, and as you grow, and you're going to end up changing based on this spectacular message that I'm delivering to you today, but it's not going to be in the jokes or the quotes or the super good way that I'm sharing it with you. It's going to come from your diligent desire to be dealing with some of these biases or some of these traumas that are creating the biases. And then all of a sudden you can understand a liberal. You can understand, for me, I'm a white guy, but I can understand black people. I can understand poor people and rich people. I can open my heart up to Gentiles and Jews and Christians alike. And I can open my heart to Muslims and hear from them. It's, it doesn't mean that I'm necessarily going to want to change my convictions or my opinions or my perceptions of what I believe is reality, but at least I should be one of those people that are, if I'm interested in relationships, if I'm interested in being challenged, if I'm interested in growing, if I'm interested in, in developing my understanding of the world that is around me, then discovering how to receive and appreciate and respect and honor the opinions of other people who may be radically different than me. Gosh, it makes my life richer. Make your life so much richer. Make your marriage better. Make your friendships better. It'll make your relationship yes. with your kids who I, yes. I am 
totally convinced are aliens seated here from another planet. <laughs> but it'll help you to understand them. Sit and talk to a young person if you're an old person. Sit and talk to an old person if you're a young person. If you don't have any black friends, get some. You don't got any white ones, get some. You don't have any Italian ones, well, that's up to you. But <laughs> You see, what we do is we, en we enrich our world by doing those things. Sure, they're challenged, you know. I was telling somebody in the washroom today, you know, I, Alex took me to the gym the other day and I can feel it everywhere. <laughs> but he says, you know, that the fellow that was in there, Theo, and he was saying, you know, that's a good thing. You know, pain is a good thing. It means you're growing. Praise the Lord. Got lots of amens there. <laughs> Listen to Paul as he's... Uh, what are we talking about? Changing your perception requires a much deeper work than just winning or losing a battle of perspectives. Perceptions are formed, I said that already, but an argument will just become another validation to hold on to people's present opinion. Can I say that again? An argument with somebody, you think you won, they just, you know, you may be better at arguing than a lot of people. Just because they be quiet don't mean that you be winning. I know that that sometimes is the way it feels. But chances are, if you beat that person down, they like you less than they liked you before. Second Timothy says this. I love this scripture, by the way. And a servant of the Lord must, be, uh, must not quarrel. There we are. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach and patient, and in humility, instructing those who are in opposition. If, this is the funny part. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so they will know the truth. The assumption there that Paul's making is, I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> Which I think doesn't demonstrate a whole lot of humility. So that's maybe God's inside joke here. The perspective that I wanted you to draw to is what happens if you are both servants of the Lord? And then you both must not quarrel, and you both must be gentle, you both must teach and be patient, and in humility instruct the other person who is in opposition to you, because they have a different perspective that you have. If, in the midst of that, God may grant them, the other person, which is also you, repentance, the ability to change your mind, the ability to change your perception. If you want to know how to change someone's perception or add your perspective to their perception, here's how you have to do it. You have to be not quarrelsome. You have to be gentle. You have to teach, of course, share your opinion. Don't just shut up and think people are mind readers. You must be patient and you must operate in this, your mind isn't far off the ground perspective. If you want that person to come to that place where they even can receive or open their minds to you. But can I tell you what this is talking about? There's a beautiful word. You know, when you're dealing with the love thing, two people just loving each other, and I serve Tina, and Tina serves Ian, and in the midst of those silly little things that we do for each other, there's this beautiful thing called synergy that happens. And I think God equals synergy. That's his presence, where the sum of the uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. I, that's the God factor that comes into our unification and our love for each other. Can I tell you, there's also something that happens in relationships. When relationships are built out of two people whose minds didn't come very far off the ground, can I tell you what begins to happen there? I think it's another God factor. It's called collaboration. And the power of collaboration is incredible when two people who are radically different perspectives take a look at the same problem all of a sudden you double the potential of solving that problem that's what's called collaboration and i think that's the god factor i think that's the god gives grace to the humble that God lifts you up when you're a humble person is because he opens the door between you and another person where that factor of collaboration starts to enter into the, into the equation. 
It's not just you and all of your friends who are just like you looking at the situation, coming up with exactly the same solution, which by the way, hasn't ever worked. Instead now we have this environment where we're two people who are radically different people opening up the door out of a, out of a loneliness, of, loneliness of mind or a preference for the other, listening to the other person's perspective, all of a sudden a problem that seemed impossible is like, pfft, that's nothing. Because you've doubled the manpower, you've doubled the brain power, you've doubled the perception power by simply opening up your mind to be able to hear from another person's perspective. Isn't that beautiful? Don't assume your perceptions are reality, no matter how, you, how strongly you feel them or how long you've held them. Everyone thinks their perception is the right one. No one has the right perception. You are only partially right, uh, if at all, at best. Honor is the, th we talked about this on the honor week. Honor is the threshold of communication. Without honor, it's just noise. A humble perception will always find a better path. Always. A humble perception will always find a better path. Humility inspires collaboration. In pride inspires competition. By winning, you lose. It's not me against you, it's us against the problem. That scripture that we talked about there earlier in 2 Timothy finishes off this way, you know, that you would certainly have come to the place through repentance and you'll come to know that I'm right. This way I'm reading Paul, but that's not really what he's saying. If you will allow yourself to have, a, have a, a humble mind, then you will come to the place where you will understand things better. It goes on to say, and they and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Can I tell you something? The, 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 the objective that we're all facing is not me against you. It's not a battle of our, of our brilliance to see who gets to win the argument today. What we need to do is we need to lock arms and realize that what's really at stake here is a battle that we have against the kingdom of darkness that is trying to, through pride and the exaltation of our own perceptions and opinions, cause us to become divided. And then when it causes us to become divided, the devil wins. And we walk away thinking we won. Number four is this, slow the heck down. You must give yourself time to absorb another person's perception. The more that person is different than you, the more time you need to absorb what they say. So you can't be in a rush. Finish your thought, then listen to theirs. Can I say that again? Finish your thought, then listen to theirs. When you're consumed with the idea that your perception is the right one, other people's perceptions are just a frustrating waste of time. And you have to make sure that your mind doesn't, if it's tracking that way, you have to remember, to check it. Say, hey, honey. Say, hey, honey. I may be wrong. Collaboration is about the interaction, your journey together, and the resulting new and greater perception that comes about because of that. Tasks, money, fun, etc., 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 steal our minds. Art Buckwald says this, the best, the best things in life aren't things. Collaboration takes time. In order for you to allow the soup to grab hold of all the bits and pieces that are in there, it takes time. If you've ever made a soup before and you just throw everything in and eat five minutes later, you're kind of wondering like, what is this? But if you'll give it a couple of hours of good solid boiling time, you could make a masterpiece. And the final point is this, number five, believe in and be content in yourself. And accept your own perceptions with all of their possible shortcomings. I'm not talking about eliminate all your perceptions or feel like your perceptions are not valid because they are somehow broken or twisted or they're formed out of the wrong traumatic events and all those things. I'm not saying that even remotely. What I'm saying is, is that we should celebrate our own perceptions and celebrate them as much as we possibly can while at the same time realizing out of a humility of mind that we may be wrong, 
that we may have a wrong perception or maybe we have one that is only partial. And what we can do from that is empower ourselves through that process of not, of just accepting that reality that we all face in our life. Can I tell you something? You will remove the need to be fixated on changing everybody else because you have become content and satisfied. You've become okay with who you are today. It's not that I'm saying don't grow. It's not that I'm saying don't change. I'm not, it's not that I'm saying don't empower yourself to be surrounded by people who are going to challenge the thoughts that you have. I'm saying start the equation by just realizing that you're a mess, just like the rest of us. But when we can learn that we're okay in the midst of that, that means I'm not afraid of you when you have a different opinion. I'm not scared of not getting what I need because you're going to get what you need. I let that all go. And just realize the beauty in this moment is that we get to have a journey together when we are radically different in our perceptions of our reality. And we get to figure out how to collaborate together to make the understanding that we have rich and powerful. We get to solve problems that nobody's ever been able to solve before. And all of it is because of one thing. Tapasu frenai. Did I say it right? Tapainafrasune. It's got the A thing at the end, so I think it's half Canadian. <laughs> Tapainafrasune. Tapainafrasune. Just don't let your mind get too far off the ground. And if I could get the ushers to just uh, in, in, you know, release the elements of communion with us this morning. Do you have something to share before? I want to share You're going to need a microphone. I'm wearing your microphone, actually. So Do I look good with the girl's microphone on, by the way? I'm so excited oh. about this message. Say that with me. We did it last night. We were yes, practicing. We Here, there's, <laughs> there's the phonetics. Yes. Um, <laughs> so we're Greek scholars wow. today. Did you get blessed by anybody? here? got blessed by wow. that a little bit. You learned something? Um, what a amazing Selah moment as you lead us into prayer and we get to take communion and start fresh today. And I just want to share this scripture because, you know, sometimes we are so ready to make the changes in our lives. And, and sometimes the argument that's being presented at the pulpit, it's just enough for us to begin to, as he said, do the work that it takes. And then sometimes God can add a little bit of perspective. I thought about, you know, Pastor, when you, you alluded to that, you talked about your father, and you talked about being a man of honor and um, how long life, yeah. long life. And Proverbs chapter 3 if, says... Yeah, brother, just let me interrupt for a second. If you knew my dad, then you would know that his middle he name was... He was never sick. Tapai Nafrasune. He was never educated, he, highly educated. Highly educated, brilliant. He read a book a day, three newspapers every morning. Principal. He, he was a principal <laughs> of a school. He had a d degrees coming out his nose. But, but this you is, would never know that talking to my dad. Unless he was you wanted never to, sick. And he was never sick and he was always happy. He was consistently just strong all the days of his life. So I feel like if maybe just... We learned a lesson from my beautiful dad. Mm -hmm, maybe just being a better person, which is what you're saying, and our relationships. Maybe that's not really going off in you. But listen to Proverbs chapter 3 as we reset things this morning. Um, it says this, Blessed are those, verse 13, who find wisdom, which is Jesus' perspective. Yeah. Those who gain understanding... For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you can desire com compares with her. For listen to this. Long life is in her right hand and in her left hand are riches and honor. This message of resetting and being a person of honor being a person who holds the perspective values and holds the perspectives of the Lord has a lot at stake in our lives. I remember hearing a phrase, unity equals prosperity. And sometimes we are looking for the 10 things, the reason why we haven't maybe received yet. Unity, 
honor the perspective of heaven. Amen? Amen. You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11 that it's, he, say, he told us to take upon us his yoke. How many of you remember that scripture? Take upon us my yoke and learn from me, he said, for I am tapainu. Mm -hmm. I have a low, I am, my mind didn't come very far off the ground, he said about himself. So we recognize Jesus knew a lot of stuff. But even though we know a lot of things and we're brilliant people and we have cell phones and satellites and put men on moon and stuff like that, doesn't mean that our mind has to come too high off the ground. Can I, I just, I, I want to be able to share this last bit. Are we doing announcements now or communion? We're doing communion. We're doing communion. Yeah. Okay. Are you here for it? Help me? No, you can stay and help me. You'll be the pretty one. <laughs> the, can I tell you that this pride thing can often hit us Christians really bad because we feel like we have a divine mandate to make sure that we tell everybody what we think because we're right. God says so. You know, that's not the right mindset. Although we are right, that's not the point. You can be right about a situation and still listen to somebody else with, with a lowliness of mind. And I think we've lost a lot of this as Christians. Because it says to us, Jesus was tapainu. He, his mind didn't come high off the ground. And that he was able to stoop down and love people who disagreed with him radically. And so as we receive communion, have you all got your communion elements with you? You know, what we do when we receive communion is we want to take a good hard look at who Jesus was and his lifestyle, the way he did things and uh, the, the clues and the foundational principles that became part of his amazing life. And that's why we serve him. That's why we're after him. That's why we pray prayers like, Jesus, I want to be just like you. Yes. And as we're doing that, we're, maybe we find ourselves in a really bad situation because we grew up in a culture that said, get your mind as high off the ground as you possibly can. That way you can dominate everybody around him and you'll get the beachfront property. But can I tell you something? When we're taking communion today, what we're doing is we're hitting the reset button and it says, Jesus, if you said you were to Pinu, then I want to be to Pinu too. I want to begin this journey of discovery of what it means to really respect and honor another person's perception, even when they're radically different than my own. I want to enter into some of these collaborative moments where I get to mind meld with another human being in a way that we can tackle something that we have never seen individually before and all of a sudden we can be victorious over that. I believe that that's Jesus' message, his life's message to us today. He said, take on the journey for sure. Take on my yoke for sure. Learn from me for sure. But don't forget to make sure that we are always in that place of Tapainu. And so say this with me. Say, Jesus, Jesus. you're the boss. Yes. You're who I want to be. And so Holy Spirit, transform my perspective. Help me to see how a lowliness of mind, how humility enters into collaboration and how collaboration solves everything. You knew that. You taught me that. Help me to become that. In Jesus' name. Thanks so much for joining us today. We pray that your life was impacted by this service and you are able to feel the tangible love of Jesus fill whatever space you're listening from. Maybe you found this message and you've never had the opportunity to come into a personal relationship with Jesus, or you've known about him, but been far from him. We want to give you the opportunity to make his love a daily reality in your life. Jesus came to this earth and died on the cross so that you could be close to him. He wanted to wipe away every disappointment and bring you into a life of purpose and meaning one that will impact this globe for good. If you'd like to begin this journey with Jesus today, then just repeat this simple prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I'm praying this prayer because I know that I've made mistakes and been living without you. I apologize and I trust that you will forgive me. 
I accept your love and grace and ask that you would be my Savior and my Lord. Help me believe in you and love you every day. And help me to show the world what you're like and how great your love is. I commit to live for you from this moment forward. In Jesus' name, amen. All of our Light City family are joining with heaven and celebrating over the commitment you have just made to make Jesus the Lord of your life. We have resources available for you to help you on this journey. And most of all, we're praying for you. Send us a note at info at golightcity.com to let us know about the decision you've made today. We have resources we would love to send you with some easy steps on where to go from here so that you can discover God in a real and meaningful way. If you have a prayer request, our team would love to connect with you and partner with you to see God transform your life. God bless you, and we look forward to hearing from you real soon.